Carnegie Mellon Business School. Um, Schreeder has uh, been involved in a lot of things. He's won three teaching awards. He has uh, published a steady stream of very high quality and high impact research papers. And on his weekends, he has successfully launched two high tech companies. In addition to that, he's done a lot of consulting. So he is a very well rounded and accomplished individual. Um, uh, Schreeder and I know each other since uh, he came to, to, uh, to the United States to, to do his graduate school. Uh, I met him when he was a PhD student at uh, Cornell University, so I've known him a long time. Uh, he's a fun guy and he's a nice guy. So um, he's going to talk to us today about the unreasonable effectiveness of certain mathematical models in practice. Okay, right there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, when I came to this country, I was 20 years old. I had to wait for a few weeks before I could legally train. Uh, at that time, I was still following most of the rules. Uh, over the years, I've realized that not all rules need to be followed all the time. <laughs> and that's generally a good attitude to have if you're an entrepreneur. I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, on that. I know that uh, this is probably a very different talk than what you're used to. So I've been thinking about uh, how can I speak to uh, an audience that is in the math department when the last 20 years or so I've spent uh, in a business school. Uh, the last time I gave a talk in the math department was in 1997. Uh, one was at MIT. I gave a talk on algebraic geometry uh, on the use of Grobner basis to solve integer programs. And then I gave a talk at, uh, I think, uh, ETH in Zurich in the math department on, on similar topics. So when I was younger, uh, I used to do a lot more things that may sound more mathematical uh, uh, to you. But the last 10 or 15 years, uh, I've split my time between uh, doing uh, mathematical research as in applied math, uh, but also trying to take uh, some of these mathematical models to practice. So what I want to talk today was mostly on the second part, uh, taking some of these mathematical models to practice. Uh, how many of you have heard of management science before? Okay. The good news is most of you have. Okay. I say it's good news because I was telling Robin, people think of application of mathematics and physics, right, or an engineer. You don't naturally think about uh, somebody who is good in math going into business, except maybe in finance, right? Mathematical finance. So one of my PhD students uh, runs the automated trading program for Credit Suisse in New York. And so some of the math work I do with him is how can Credit Suisse make even more money, you know, moving money around. So, uh, so that's an example of mathematics and business, but it's related in some sense to, uh, to, to finance. And so some of you who uh, are not offended uh, about making money might want to go to Wall Street. <laughs> I also bring this up, as I was telling earlier at uh, lunch, uh, that me going to the business school and me becoming an entrepreneur is a huge cultural change from where I came. So uh, coming from India, my parents were very conservative. I wouldn't say overly religious, but at least they practiced religion. Uh, you know, quite seriously, uh, within the Hindu, uh, 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 let's say, religion, there is something called Brahmins. These are the priest class, and I belong to the priest class. So ideally, I should do math and Sanskrit, not think about making money, not wear Italian clothes, you know, not think about women, you know, be a bachelor all my life, you know, gain knowledge from the universe and be one with the universe and so on. When I was a teenager, I realized that maybe I was born a Brahmin, but I didn't want to live with it. <laughs> <laughs> However, I did have one skill, which was I was pretty good at math. So I thought, what can I do that can parlay my skill in math and maybe not be uh, a Brahmin, but maybe be an Italian? Okay, so that's kind of the journey. <laughs> Let me throw something that I think you will recognize. 
these are products that you and I or somebody in the family buys. Right? <coughs> what I want to talk about in the first part of this talk I, is about companies that make these products. Right? Cereal, Kellogg's. Right? Flu medicine. Uh, you, you take a look at the Smothers, Jam, right? Advil. Uh, Unilever makes a lot of things, shampoos and stuff. I just threw out a few things. This is called consumer packaged goods industry. Okay? So these are people who make stuff that you and I buy. Okay? Now, what does making mean? Making means they buy something called raw materials, which could actually be finished products for some other company. And I'm just introducing some language here so you can get the flavor of this. Then they put it together, they have some machines, they make some products or semi-finished products. They may sell it to another company like themselves, or they may sell it to Target or Walmart or, you know, I don't know what the local grocer here is. Uh, uh, and you and I go there and buy. The study of how material gets purchased, manufactured, moved, and sold, this entire business, is called supply chain management. Okay? Supply chain management is one area of business school, which is what I do. Okay? So my first example is going to be a very core business problem by companies that make these products. Where does the math come? One of the most important investments companies make is the amount of money they use on inventories. Okay? So what is inventory? So if you walk to a, a shop and you see some stuff sitting on a shelf, that is inventory. Okay? That's inventory of finished goods because it's ready for you to purchase. But you take a step back, there is a warehouse of Target, right? Which also finished goods inventory. Why is it there? It's there because it needs to be moved to the store so that it replaces what you and I bought from the store. Right? It is still finished goods, right? But it's really there as a staging device for the store and then you and I buy it. So this would be an example of a two-stage system. A warehouse stage and a store stage. Okay? I bring this up because my first example is, is called multi-stage inventory optimization. And so a company like Target would ask, how much inventory do I need in my warehouse? And how much inventory do I need in my store? So that what? <laughs> So that you and I can get what we want, but they haven't tied up too much of their money in inventory. But because they don't know what you and I want, they have to do some forecast. That means one of their signals is what is going to be bought in every store, in every day, of every product. It's unlikely they have this exactly mapped out. And therefore, the branch of mathematics that is applicable here has something to do with probability distribution. Stochastic models. Okay? So, the kind of math I do is the use of stochastic models to solve inventory problems in a multi-state supply chain of companies that make physical products that you and I have. Now, what is a model? A model is an abstraction. Right? It's an imagination. You can make up whatever you want. Right? It has to be consistent. It has to be fully defined. It should be interesting enough for you to work out. So a model has some features. And the feature I'll start off for this is called a discrete time model. Again, those of you who know some physics know that you have a choice. You can view time as continuous, like Newton and others did, even Einstein, right? Continuous time. Or you can view time as discrete, 
And what we do here is discrete because we think of it as, hey, every morning you look at inventory, you see what sells, you look at the end of the day and say, oops, I need to get the inventory back. So although time is actually happening continuously and you and I are buying things continuously, the abstract model is discrete. This area is called discrete time, stochastic, multi-stage inventory model. And one of its inputs is the uncertain stochastic nature of demand. Now, every day is not like every other day. Mondays are different from Fridays, weekends are different from weekdays, game days are different from other days, Super Bowl's coming, it's going to be different, weather's bad, right? And you laugh at it, but somebody is concerned about it, and those are guys like me. <laughs> right? You don't want to go on a Super Bowl and not find your favorite chips, right? Now, New England lost last week, so I think the amount of demand for Super Bowl in Boston is going to be lower, right? right? But it's therefore increased in San Francisco, right? And so if you're Kellogg's, you're probably redistributing this movement. So if Pop-Tarts sell, for example, in the Super Bowl. So that's what, so when things change over time, it's called non-stationary. So this is a discrete time, stochastic, non-stationary, multi-stage inventory. I'll introduce one last concept and then I'll go to the next slide. <coughs> now, the supply chain has many different companies and many different people within a company managing the piece. Therefore, a decision that's optimal for Kellogg's might not be optimal for Target. If Target and Kellogg's were owned by the same person, then somebody could think about a joint optimization across the supply chain, and that would be called a centralized model, as if there was like a central authority who is looking at the complete optimization. But what makes the real world more interesting is the fact that you have all these different players, each with their own self-interest. Target people are trying to maximize target stock price. Their interest in Kellogg's is in as much as Kellogg's doesn't go out of business. But beyond that, they don't care about Kellogg's. <laughs> right? Similarly, Kellogg's interest in target is as a channel partner to sell stuff. But if they squeeze you too much, it's not worth being a partner. This area of different people competing with objectives, different objectives is called BMC. So what makes this interesting is you have a discrete time, stochastic, time varying, blah, blah, blah model. But then you embed DMC in it. So then you start having Okay? So that's kind of the mathematical basis of what is going on. What I want to spend time today is to just describe to you the kinds of things that people in business care about for which the outputs of these models are very useful. Okay? That's one piece. The second piece, since some of you have heard of management science, is what is management science? What is the goal of management science? So I think the best is to read an article by Peter Drucker. How many of you have heard of Peter Drucker? Okay. He's like the Isaac Newton of management. That is, he sat down and said, what is management? What should managers think about? How do you organize a company? Like when you say, hey, how come this company has different divisions? How come there is a CEO and a CFO? Who put like some thought into all of these topics? Is this guy called Peter Drucker. In math, if you're a famous mathematician, you know, you, you become a famous mathematician, you might win some award and, some, and stuff like that. Right? In business, you're called a management guru. <laughs> It's funny because coming from India, guru means something else. But then, <laughs> management guru is a contradiction. So finally, I told my dad, you know, dad, I'm a Brahmin, I'm a guru, except that I'm a management guru. It doesn't count. But, <laughs> right? But these are management gurus. So, you know, if you look around and you say, who are these guys who are providing these deep thoughts in management? They're people like that. Okay? Why I put it here is. I take this view that the use of mathematical models in business is to help a manager make better decisions. 
Okay? So when you construct a model, in math, if you are a pure mathematician, you may be driven by the purity, the, the elegance of it. It is, it, is, it is your own happiness in some sense. You are not doing it for anybody else. Right? It is, it is, it is personal satisfaction. This is almost the opposite. The only reason Kellogg's is interested in my mathematical model is it because its stock price is going to go up. <laughs> the elegance is irrelevant to them. Most of the time they said, don't even tell me how it works. <laughs> Just press the button, okay? You'll see the stock price move after some time and we'll pay you if it moves. Okay, how about that? That's called contingent payments. Okay, okay but the goal of management science is to have this, okay? And the last piece I want to bring together. As Robin mentioned, I actually have lived two lives in Bali. On the one hand, I went, I taught classes, I undergraduate teaching award, MBA teaching award, I have graduated PhD students who are professors at Stanford, and their PhD students are professors at Chicago, and so on and so forth. I wrote papers, I have reference, I won academic awards, and so that one life which is, hey, this guy is writing some math papers, he's doing some teaching, he's generating some PhD students, he's perpetuating this game of writing more papers. And because I've done that so well, I've been given the highest award in the field for perpetuating the field for its own sake. So there's one line that is, oh, this dude can generate stuff and create people who can generate stuff for the sake of just generating stuff. <laughs> no, some of you laugh, but math professors are like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> the core of the math professor is to perpetuate the existence of math professors, right? That's all it is. But then there's a second piece, which says, wait a minute, how does this whole thing get funded? Who is paying for this? <laughs> right? Where is this money coming from? <laughs> right? And at least in the United States, this is the game that we have decided to play. Right? This is not the game that used to be in India when I was growing up, because it was mostly a socialist country. And sometime in 1991, they kind of turned around and said, you know what, I think we should give, you know, entrepreneurship and capitalism a chance. Right? And India has kind of skyrocketed, uh, you know, in some way. There are many countries in the world where this would make no sense. Right? It's all government controlled stuff. But the United States has always been, at least the last 100, 150 years, driven by the following belief. That you show up, you have an idea. And you say, you know what, I'm going to take this idea, I'm going to do something with it. I'm going to have fun with it. Part of what you're going to get for having fun is a lot of money. For some people, that is the primary driver. For most entrepreneurs, it's actually not the primary driver. If you look at the interviews of most entrepreneurs, money is interesting but only comes second to the primary driver of some other satisfaction of ego. It is. It is to make the world work a particular way that is bring their viewpoint to life. A side effect is making money. Right? And I like this quote. I read this maybe in the, in the 1990s. And I said, you know what? This makes sense. Not everybody needs to be an entrepreneur. But having no entrepreneur is a bad news. Right? And so what I want to talk about here is combining management science with entrepreneurship. Okay? And going forward to some example. Who has heard of Celestica? Nobody. He <laughs> said, they are everywhere. It's like a villain of a James Bond movie. <laughs> right? We are everywhere. You can't see us. You see a quantum of solace, right? <laughs> they are everywhere. What do they make? They make almost everything. They make communication devices. They make uh, laptops, game, game games that you play with, enterprise computing, uh, they make smartphones. Why haven't you heard of it? They didn't want to be heard about. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> for other brand names. What has happened in America is Apple does not make iPhones. Who makes iPhones? Foxconn. Foxconn. Also called Hon Hai. 
Why are they in the news? Because of bad child labor practices and suicides and so on and so forth. Why? Because they've been squeezing cost out of you know, the people in China. But Apple does not make anything. Apple designs, it markets. And all manufacturing is outsourced to companies like Celestica. So these guys make blackberries. Okay? And I'll go through the competitors, Foxconn and Sanmina and others. So I bring this up because, again, to understand the way the world works, and say, what is outsourced? What is outsourced is all the manufacturing of the things that we buy. And so what is the debate in the, in, you know, that's in the country? Apple is making great money. But all the jobs are actually offshore. So when you say Apple is making a lot of money, it means the Apple shareholders are making a lot of money. Right? But the employment is elsewhere. But let's say Celestica calls me up and says, hey, I need your help. I need to beat Foxconn. What shall we do? So if you look at inventories, just to take a wild shot, how many dollars do you think are tied up in inventory in the United States at any given instant? Five trillion? Five trillion? It's one trillion at least. So I was never a very studious guy of inventory when I was a PhD student, Robin knows this. But I listened to this and I said, there's one trillion dollars of inventory? If I can remove one percent of unnecessary inventory, and get paid 1% for every one of that inventory I removed, wouldn't I be like in the top 0.1% of the world? <laughs> yes! And here it is. Okay? <laughs> that's, that's all it is. That's all it is. That's all it is. I did not do inventory models because of its elegance, although they are elegant. I did it because it creates economic value and it allows me to monetize it so that I could be any time. Okay? So what happens is most companies, if you look at the world, right? There's companies, the factories everywhere. How do they coordinate? What does the guy in China know what's happening in Mexico? What is the connection? And so I told these guys, look, you have a supply, you have some capacity, you have some demand, but you got this inventory, maybe a few hundred million lying around. Imagine it. Imagine. If I gave you something that connects inventories across all your facilities in a computer package and tells every one of them how to put it, knowing the answer to everything else. Again, when you talk to your CEO, you should not use math, you should use simple pictures. <laughs> so I said, remove the slash with a gear. The guy says, you can do that? I said, yeah. Says, I have 600 million in inventory. Do you think you can take off 60 million? I said, yeah, in about a year. And how much do you want? I said, six million. We go back and forth. They said, take two. I said, give me three, give me four. They said, we agreed on four. <laughs> <laughs> okay? No. Nah. We said, oh. <laughs> right? So I said, you don't know where you have inventory, and most importantly, you don't know why you have inventory. So let me bring some scientific logic to this. Hey, kid. <laughs> and let me show you the math. Again. We talked about stochastic, multi-phase, non-stationary. What does dynamic mean? Dynamic means that every week, they update their forecast. Why? Because we had new products introduced, there's new marketing campaigns, you find out what a competitor does, right? So you need to have this refreshed game being played, right? So what does your package need to do? It needs to model the system, it needs to take the updated information, crank out some answers, and globally disperse them. So that everybody in the world knows exactly what everybody else is doing. Right? According to lead time capacities and so on. And so that, in some sense, is the mathematical model and for which I created a fast enough algorithm. So you have a model, you need to solve it. How do you solve a model? You need an algorithm. An algorithm is something that gives an answer. You don't need to get the perfect answer, you need to get an answer that's better than the answer that they are using. No, no, it's very important. Because 
when you take a math problem, you can solve it to optimality or you can get good enough, fast enough. This is the good enough, fast enough business idea. It has one other advantage. If I gave them the best answer right now, then how can I go back three years and get five more million from them? <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is think. <laughs> think. Not like a mathematician, but like a businessman who knows some mathematics. Right? Because you're trying to prove the answer fast. I'll give you a four-line solution. It is so quick, I get the answer quickly. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. I'm not trying to make it fast. I'm trying to make it just fast enough for you to buy it, and I'll come back in three years and say, hey, for two more million, I can make it faster. <laughs> for four more million, I can make it better. Okay? Right? That's the case. What happens is, at some point, their answers and my answers should be different. And in some places I say you keep more inventory, some places you keep less inventory. Overall they keep less inventory, which means that they have less money to have, which is called the balance sheet. That extra cash is in their hands, and what does the company do with extra cash? They can distribute it to shareholders as dividends, or they can reinvest in their company for future growth. And so the typical pitch I gave a senior executive is, what if I freed up $100 million of your cash over the next two, three years? And I said, great, but don't miss service levels. I don't want my customers to be upset. So make sure that when somebody goes to a store, they get the pop tart that they want. Having said that, reduce the amount. Okay? That's the math problem being. So I've done this about 100 times. And these are the different uh, sectors. This is the average amount of inventory we have taken off. That's sizable. So I think I lost count at about five or six billion, but uh, I've taken, I think, between five to ten billion dollars of inventory out in the last few years. This company, Celestica, when they first started, they were third in ROIC means return on invested capital. So when you're a publicly traded company, you have to reveal your stats to the street, to Wall Street. And they look at it and say, what is your return on invested capital? That is, I give you some money to play with, you give me some return, I look at the return over the money I gave you, and then if you do a great job in it, I'll give you more money. That's how the stock market is played. Okay, so a major driver in any company is something called return on invested capital. Like how efficiently are you using the capital that you're taking? Okay, that's the mathematical measure that the chief financial officer of a company looks at. EBIT is earnings before interest, uh, amortization, and taxes, and that is what you see when you open the Wall Street Journal. Right? Apple announces fourth quarter results. EPS greater than 5. They are talking about earnings per share, which is earnings divided per number. So I bring this up because this is what companies measure mathematically as the health of their business. This is what moves the stock price. This is what is the compensation of the senior executives. So what happens is, when you are young, you get a fixed salary. You might get a little bit bonus for being a good citizen and working hard and working on weekends. But most of your salary is a fixed lump sum called the salary. As you climb the hierarchy, more and more of your salary is actually variable salary. So if you take a CEO salary and they make say 15 million a year, only 4 million may be fixed. 11 of it varies based on this performance. And so in some years they make 5.2, some years they make 19.6. That's how we have decided to play the game. That is, we tell the senior executives, look, Two-thirds of your money is based on this performance, which is based on the stockholders' returns, right? We're all stockholders. And that's what this is. So you can see how Celestica moved from three to one because of this. This is John Deere. Uh, just very quickly, uh, we cut out about a billion dollars over five years from their inventories, and you can see the stock. Okay? So first example is the use of mathematics to solve a problem of inventories that is crucial to most manufacturing companies. 
and for publicly traded companies it is a direct effect on their valuation which is basically reflected by the stock price. Okay? So some of you may say, hey man, this is too boring. So I thought, why don't I pick something that could be more fun? Right? Because they say, look, I want to make money, but I don't want to do boring business things. I don't want to wear a jacket and tie. I don't want to do PowerPoint. Right? So what can I do? So I said, let's do video games. So this is like a uh, you know, CNBC site. And what are those? Those are ads. Did you ever wonder who puts them there? See, I do. <laughs> I do, meaning my PhD student, right? Right, we Then you say, ah, who decides? What is the criteria? What is the, what is the math model? I mean, what is running in the background? Where is it running? Right? So, who is paying? Right? So this is a video game. Probably not a good place to show Barack Obama photo here, but <laughs> <laughs> right? That is a inventory element in a video. So somebody in Barack Obama's marketing team said, hey, let's send some money and post his pictures in all video games with cars because these guys might go out and vote and I would rather see Barack Obama's picture over there. Okay? Many of you play video games, you're driving your car, you see a Pepsi ad out there, right? That, that's, that's part of this. So what is the problem? The game is like this. You are a company and you need to sell you something. If you have a product that you already want, like iPhone, that's great. But what if you're selling a product that is not very exciting? What is the most crucial spend in a company other than, you know, people and machines? Marketing, advertising. You might not believe this, but there's incredible amount of math that goes into figuring out how to do advertising. And in today, they target it by saying, oh, it's male, 18, he loves video games with guns, give him this ad. It's personalized, targeted, dynamic ad. It is that detailed. When you get an ad on your mobile phone, they know exactly who you are. That's part of the privacy issues that you know, people have been fighting for. Right? And so what, what is happening here is, in the olden days, before there was radio, before there was television, all advertisement would be in newspapers. Right? Then radio came and people said, let's take some money out of newspapers and give it to radio. Right? And then TV came and they said, give it to TV. Right? Super Bowl ad for 30 seconds goes for 2 million. What does that mean? There is somebody in Frito-Lay or somebody in Coca-Cola with a budget of say 200 million and then saying, you know what, Super Bowl, we got to have the 30 second start, put 2 million on there. The same people came out and said, you know what, people are not watching TV anymore. Not as much. What are they doing? 18 to 34 year old males are playing video games. So they said, how do we get to these guys? They're not watching TV. You got to put the ads where the customers are. Right? And so a company called Massive was created by one of my friends. And she said, you know what, I want to create a company. So this is what inventory means. Let me show you the business model in a second. So there is a server. It's called the Ad Network. There is a publisher of games like Electronic Arts. What Electronic Arts used to do is they used to send CDs or, you know, to our homes, we would plug it in, right, like Nintendo, and we would play. This was not connected to the internet. It was hard-coded, and any advertisement was hard-coded into that. But then the internet came along, and people said, no, 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 the games are not played that way. These are multiplayer games. You may be playing with somebody in Shanghai. You are on the same game. But where is that game? It's not on your console. It's not on that console. It's in the ad network console. 
when you log in to play the video game, you are going somewhere, right? That ad server. That belongs to my friend's company, Massive. So they go and tell Electronic Arts, send us a game with everything, except where you used to put ads, send blanks. So what the games is, you get the full game, except that when you take the race car turn, instead of having Pepsi, Frito-Lay, you know, Deutsche Bank, it's all empty, the empty elements. Okay? So that's what the game producers do, and ship it to Mass. Now, these are the players. <laughs> right? So some dude is sitting there, <laughs> doing homework or not doing homework, you know, hacking, not hacking, you know. Right? They're playing games. Right? And many professors may be laughing, they don't know their kids are doing this. Right? <laughs> and then you have Coca Cola. So, what this company says, Coca Cola is, hey, how about I provide 30 million impressions over the next month to 100,000 unique viewers? who are men between the ages of 18 to 34 in the United States and in Europe. Right? So Coca-Cola says how much? Some five, six million, whatever, they come with the number. Then, this company has to make sure that these things get distributed. But remember, there's not just Coca-Cola, there's Pepsi, there's everybody else, right? And so, what happens is, there is a marketing team of this company, talking to the marketing team of this company and saying, Coca-Cola, stop wasting money on Super Bowl ads, give the money to video games. Right? That's what these guys are fighting. The computer science guys here and the computer science guys are here talking about the fact that these guys can give them the game and with blanks and these guys can play it and put these impressions in there just in time so that the game fidelity is not lost. Because you don't want to turn the car and then slowly the Pepsi ad comes. See, that's not. <laughs> right? That takes the fidelity of the game away. So what you have here are all the computer science guys from MIT and Stanford, right, sitting up there, and you have all the marketing people from Wharton and Harvard. Okay? That's what this team is. And my friend, she's an MBA from Harvard. So she said, look, let me get some MBAs for selling, some PhDs for building, and ready to go. What she did have was some mechanism that takes all of these contracts requirements, all the games these guys are playing, you don't know who's going to play the game, who's not going to play the game, what if some guy gets sick and not play the game for three days? And each game has multiple levels, what if you don't get all the way to the level? And if you don't meet your impression goals, this guy is measuring it, you're going to lose money on the contract. So the mathematical model that she wanted solved was how do I take all the contracts that I have and make sure that I have zero penalties at the end of the month. But you can't show the same, the same person Pepsi, 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 Pepsi 50 times. Two things happen. That is called not enough unique visitors. And two, something called saturation. If you see Pepsi so they're like, I am not going to drink Pepsi anymore. <laughs> Right? And so you have constraints. And you can't put Pepsi and Coke next to each other because that defeats the purpose. <laughs> right? And so there's a saturation constraint, there's a unique viewer requirement, and there's a distinctive constraint. That's kind of mathematics inside this. And she said, hey, you know some math, right? I said, yeah. She said, can you do this? I said, of course I can. But why would I do this? Why? Because there is money in there. So I said, how about you give me part of the money and suddenly I'm interested. Right? <laughs> anyway, so it's gone beyond, you know, into TV, into games and wealth. By the way, the massive was bought by Microsoft for $400 million in cash. She is 29. Right? So this is the math problem. So, you say, what can I do? If you're good at math, you like computer science, you want to join some startup, some equity, right? Hang out in Soho, New York, and have a good life while writing some games, and then wait for Google or Microsoft to buy you up, 
and then maybe retire back and ski. <laughs> so this is the second, again, as I said, this is because the marketing has changed from TV to video games. The last piece I want to do is actually a departure uh, for the last uh, many years of my life. I've decided to grow a conference and for once actually do something not to make money but to actually help you. Robin was doing a double take. He's like, what happened to you? <laughs> right? How did this happen? I, I, I call it uh, basically, uh, you know, midlife crisis. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? What happens is, you know, when you're young, you're like, hey, I'm having fun, I'm buying cars, I'm wearing nice, nice clothes, I'm wearing nice clothes, and then you get older and you say, really? Is that it? Is all that there is? Right? It's unfortunate, but there comes a point in time that even a shallow guy like me starts thinking. <laughs> right? And then you say, maybe I can be of some use to somebody other than myself. Right? And then, and my kid. So I did not know this a couple of years ago. So as I finish this talk, and we finish with questions and so on, one more person will die in this. Okay? At the same time, many kidneys are wasted that means many lives could have been saved. And the likelihood depends on the next geography. Utah turns out to be a good place to have a kidney problem. But I'm not saying having a kidney problem is good. But conditional on the fact that you have a kidney problem in Utah is good because the waiting times for a kidney here are pretty good. And Intermountain Healthcare, which is here, is actually one of the better you know, hospitals. But if you were in New York or in Boston or in Los Angeles, then your wait times can exceed four to five years, which means that mostly you will not make. It's not just kidney, it's also liver. So name a famous person who was going to die in California, but because he was so rich, he said no, and he got liver somewhere else. Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. Because it doesn't matter if you are a multi-billionaire, you have to stand in line. Except the lines are different in California than in Memphis. He had his own G5, which is a very nice plan. And his own pilots. So while he was doing iPod, iPad, whatever he was designing, he put himself on four or five lists, I think 12, and told his pilots when the phone call comes, because when a dead body arrives and you take the kidney out or a liver out, it's a very short period of time. And you need to get to the OR to get the kidney or the liver, otherwise it's wasted. So the ability for you to be on a transplant list is determined by many factors including can you get there fast enough? If you don't have your own private jet, then you're not going to get to Memphis from California in six hours. You know, I said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make Steve Jobs what Steve Jobs had for every America. I'm going to democratize Steve Jobs. Okay? And so that's what it is. So, just to show you what's happening, there are supply of kidneys, there are you know, demand for kidneys, and then some kidneys are wasted in regions where people can't get to quick enough, and in other you know, places, you know, people are dying. Which begs the first question, why can't you ship the kidneys or liver from place A to place B? Why? Suppose you could do it in four hours. The word is too fragile. It costs too much. Support the order. No. There is no. No. It's never been done that way. It's never been done that way. And why? For 20 years, people have been trying in this country to have one national list, so that there is sharing of organs across the country. Because it's much easier to fly an organ somewhere in four to six hours than to fly a person in four to six hours, let alone have them pre-tested and so on and so forth. Why do you think it's not happening? Cost? Politics? Related to what? Privacy. Related to what? Math department guys, I'm trying to tell you to think differently. <laughs> what is the only thing that drives everything in a capitalist society? Money! <laughs> Why? Because the money that you make is done in the transplant. 
not in the pre-op activity, not in the post-op activity. Those are all margin losses. So no transplant center is ever going to give up their kidney or liver because that's where the money is made. So until there's a wholesale change in payments, which is never going to happen, in a rational, capitalist, multi-agent game world, these are not going to get shared. It's just not going to happen for 20 years. So I said, you know what? We're going to do two things. One, in the meantime, I'm going to make people fly as cheaply as possible so that we don't have to do these jobs. And two, I'm going to mount a campaign to make a change. Okay? And he said, why? Midlife crisis. Right? <laughs> That's all it is. <laughs> so where's the math? It turns that each of the different regions, there are 58 of them, where people are waiting in a list, can be viewed as a queuing model. So what's a queuing model? Queuing model is there are arrivals that come to a queue, like a teller in a bank. The teller performs a service, and then you leave. That is called a queue. So queuing theory is quite well known in the field of applied management. So imagine each of the 58 regions in this country that do not share today as a queue. The arrivals to the queue are people who are sick and who want a kidney. Right? And a service means a transplant occurs. What happens during waiting in the queue? You keep waiting, you keep waiting, you may die. That's called queues with abandonment. If the arrival rate to the queue, which is usually given by lambda, is less than the service rate, which is mu, which is usually what happens in a bank or you know things of that type, it's called a regular queue. Okay, that's called a lambda less than mu because it's clear. This is called an overcrowded queue because the number of arrivals on a daily basis to the queue far exceed the number of new organs. In the queue. So the branch of mathematics is called overcrowded queues with abandonment. So that's been there for a while. So I said, aha. Let me take this 58 different overcrowded queues with abandonment. And rather than them be 58 independent ones, how about I create a network of these 58 queues where people can go from one to another. That is, I can reroute the arrivals, right? From Boston to Pittsburgh, from Chicago to Wisconsin. And so, basically, I model this, along with some co-authors, as an overloaded queuing network. Now, how do you route this? You will only go from place A to place B if place B is better for you than place A. Right? You wouldn't go from one bad place to another bad place. But then, you're not the only person making a choice. Everybody is making a choice. right? So, this is called selfish routing in game theory. And what you get is something called a Nash equilibrium. So what I did was work out the Nash equilibrium of a selfish routing game on an overcrowded network of queues with abandonment. Went to UNOS, which is the United Network of Organ Sharing, got data from them and said, okay, let me take actual data of how many people are waiting, dying, you know, in each of these regions and see how the network would come out. And again, I separate by blood type because there is some compatibility by blood type. Big circles means you need to fly out, small circles means you have to fly in. So this is how the model would be if you want to equalize the weight. Okay? You say, man, that seems very crowded. Seems messy. So I said, let me start with something simple. Suppose I look at only a few most difficult places, right? Seems, but I get 60% of the people, right? So it's a good start. So we've been doing this for some time. I have 115 patients who have been talking through and multiple listing and, and, and so on and so forth. Right? So you can imagine the number of emails I get from their wives and their children saying, thank you for, you know, saving my life. I said, you have no idea, you know, what I, <laughs> capitalist guy I am, 
You know, they think I'm a saint. Yeah, right? Yeah, I get emails saying, oh, you must be from God. I said, no, madam, I'm from Pittsburgh. Yeah, so, <laughs> let's not take this too seriously. But you know, for them, it is serious, right? Because, you know, they were going to die and now they're not. Right? What happens is, if about 17 to 20 percent of the people can multiple this carefully, then things get equalized. The second issue, which is of interest, I skipped by it, is the following. Why is a kidney being wasted in Wisconsin when it could be used in Boston? I can think like a game theorist. All kidneys are not equal. Right? Some kidneys come from younger people or healthier people, and some kidneys come from older and healthier people. So if you are living in Wisconsin and your wait time is only nine months to get a kidney, you're going to be pretty picky, I think, about the kidney you would accept for your transplant, right? But if you are in New York and the wait time is six years, you're like, is that, does it work? <laughs> right? You take it. Therefore, if you look at the quality of kidneys that are extracted in New York and transplanted in New York, they are of a far lower quality than you will see in Memphis or in Wisconsin. It's just rational. But it's not as if people in those places are naturally healthy. What does it mean? It means that there are many organs that are coming up there that people are choosing not to use. But if I can take 10 or 15 percent of people from Boston and New York and put them elsewhere, what happens? New York and Boston waiting times will come down because they have relieved them of some cure. But I made life a bit harder in Wisconsin and in Pittsburgh, right? Right? I have made life somewhat worse off. So people are like, wait a minute, why is this guy flying in from here? Anyway, but right? But never go up so high to right? you never travel if this is much higher than this, right? So it goes up but not as high as the bad places. But more importantly, it means that you will be less picky. You'll actually be less. Anyway, this got enough of a uh, interest from three sources. One, the head of UNOS, which is the United Network Organ Sharing, his name is John Roberts. He is going to write an article to all people saying, hey, look at what this guy is doing. I think we need to rethink our sharing strategy because he's ridiculing us. Right? In some sense, I'm shaming him. I'm saying, you guys can't figure out a more equitable sharing because of your self-interest of money, and I'm doing something ridiculous like putting people in a private jet and flying them all around the place. Right? That's because I have a network of 18,000 jets and I can fly them around. Right? So I said to John, this is how it's going to work. While you guys are debating, I'm trying to save as many lives as I can. But the right answer, my dear friends, is for you to change your rules. At which point, I should no longer exist. Right? And that's what I was telling Robin. The goal of a social enterprise is to remove the very injustice for which it was created. And once the injustice is gone, then you should no longer exist. Right? The real success of organ jet is when the system changes, when the organs are being shared, when you have the equal chance of getting a transplant, whether you're in New York or in Wisconsin, and I don't need to fly these people around. The second person who took interest in this is Al Roth. I got to Al Roth. He won this year's Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. So he's a game theory OR guy. He has done some work on matching algorithms. And one of his ideas was in something called live donors, live uh, exchange of kidneys. So he wrote a blog and said, look at what this Carnegie Mellon professor is doing. And that has been good, because when a Nobel laureate blogs about you, generally people listen. And then the third person, which has nothing to do with the first and second, is actually a libertarian worker out of uh, Boston, who's a venture capitalist, who has always been, you know, saying why Obama is the worst thing for this planet and why the medical system is screwed up and so on and so forth. It just so happens he's a good friend of mine. And he decided to blog by saying, look at what this guy is doing. How bad is our system that we need to fly people around in a private jet? Right? So I'm hoping that as we are helping people within the system, we are now creating enough noise, whether it be from the UNOS itself, right, the people internally, 
or somebody as scientific as a Nobel laureate <laughs> or a libertarian, you know, to kind of, to kind of move the move the But anyway, the math model under this, as I said, was the queuing. Here's one email. Uh, it turns out that Lauren was actually a student of mine. Uh, her husband needs a kidney, so this is on Facebook. Uh, I've asked Wisconsin to make some changes, so this is from Dixon, who is the head of surgery at Wisconsin. And so I want to close to say, why do I do what I do? And I, and I thought this was the best example I could, the best one. I opened with entrepreneurship, I want to close it out. I do it because I find it fun. Since I cannot write as well as Joseph Schumpeter, I <laughs> thought I'd just do this card. <laughs> okay? So I look at it and say, yes, that's it. That's how it is. I get up in the morning and I say, what more, what else can I take? Okay? Let me stop here and take any questions. I incorporated it in May of 2011. I think I got the first few uh, patients signed up towards uh, December of 2011. And then I created a not-for-profit subsidiary called Guardian Wings in June of 2012 because there are many people whose insurance doesn't pay and I want to cross-subsidize them. So that's called a contract hybrid and that's been around for a while. What sort of educational track would an undergraduate think about following if they were interested in going into operations research like this, like PhD in operations research, or is there another way to do it, or business, or what's the difference there? Well, you know, I think of this as an intersection of, uh, you know, economics, mathematical economics, and, you know, operations research, right? Uh, so, sometimes when you go to the econ department, you get driven to other problems of economics, not necessarily these type of problems. So, what is becoming common is even in OR today, they teach you enough economics and game theory, the math, the math side of it, that you could, you know, bridge it. Uh, I would say OR is a good program. These days, actually, many business schools are doing it. So if you think about uh, OR programs like Cornell, which is where I went to school, and Columbia, uh, you know, Stanford used to have an OR department, but, you know, they got shut down. Uh, those are some of the places where they do this, but if you go to MIT Sloan uh, or Carnegie Mellon or if you even go to uh, Stanford Business School, so Barish who is my co-author is the Stanford Business School, PhD. Uh, some of the early work uh, with respect to accept, reject of kidneys, uh, with respect to, you know, should I take it or not, was done by Stephanos, who is a professor at Stanford Business School, uh, who got his PhD in OR from MIT. So, you can do MIT, OR, Sloan, you can do Stanford Business School, CME, Wharton. So you will see a lot of uh, mathematically oriented operations management departments kind of do things like this. Uh, or straight up OR. Right. I see now a lot of students coming in with undergraduate in double E in, in computer science uh, into, uh, into OR and things like this. Because I think healthcare is pulling people from all different directions. Right? It could be healthcare analytics, it could be healthcare policy, right? right? If you think about an industry viewpoint, not from a uh, math viewpoint, but an industry viewpoint, uh, I think healthcare in this country is taking, you know, uh, is showing a lot of interest and uh, looking for a lot of innovation. Uh, so any of those programs. So the process of looking at a problem and then mathematizing it and developing your model seems like one of the more challenging steps. How do you develop the model making talent? So, uh, I don't know if it can be taught other than by doing. Uh, right, and so I started doing it and over time I guess I just gravitated towards modeling that could be used. Right, uh, and then I started looking at why are some models more useful than others, right? And I, I believe that what you need are three things. One, it has to be rich enough to, uh, uh, to 
convince people who make decisions that the output of these models are worth doing. See, what happens if the model is too simple is that you might get clean results, but nobody's buying the story. Right? And that's where the challenge comes. That is, you know, as Einstein probably said, a model should be simple but no simple. I mean, I mean that, and that's, what, that, that's the boundary we're looking for, right? Uh, if it's too complex and you put like a kitchen sink everywhere, there's nothing to be said, right? It, it, it looks like a mess. So I would say you almost have to start simple, 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 make it complex, complex. Guys are still not, you know, they're thinking it's too simple, it's too simple. At some point, you cross over, right? Or you can start by uh, starting from, to get all the mess and say, if I remove this, is it okay? If I remove this, okay, and hopefully you can convert some. So I think one piece of it is the model should be rich enough. Second, I think people only believe when they look at it with their data. So what I've done, when you look at those 100 companies I've worked with, I can't go to Kellogg's and say, hey, by the way, it worked for Celestica. He's going to say, I'm, that's interesting. Uh, but you've got to show me it works for me. Right? Because I'm not in the Blackberry business, I'm in the Popcorn business. Right? And therefore, right? And, 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 and it's great that a Canadian company is doing well, but you know, I'm in Battle Creek, Michigan. What do I care about? Right? So, you have to look at a model and say, is the data available for it to feed the model? And in some sense, the model has to be, again, parsimonious enough, not only from a model richness perspective, but from its data requirement perspective. Right? You should, right? And especially if you're trying to do something that's repeatable. Say, when I started SmartOps, which was the uh, software company that I talked about first, I wanted one software and I wanted to repeatedly sell to 100 companies. Because that's where the margin comes. Okay. If I did 100 custom projects, you know, it just it couldn't make enough money. Right? And so there I had to be careful about setting it up so that there's a model, and for some companies you have to make it more detailed. For some companies, they can get away with less detail, and so you build in some kind of a configuration flexibility on that model. Right? And so we start thinking, maybe for uh, consumer package companies, they care about this kind of complexity, this is the kind of data that they have, and so I start building templates so that it would be the same right, software code, but then the template for each company could be slightly different. Right? They could get con configured. The second piece is the data. And the third piece is, again, going back to the uh, management science code. It's very rare that people will look at an output of a math model and say, yep, I'll do it. Right? I don't think anybody does. They won't do it with portfolio management of their money. I mean, they would. Because this is too important for them. Right? On the one hand, we want to solve an important problem. Right? But if it's an important problem, people are like, I got to double check. Right? And so you have to anticipate a certain kind of conservatism in the part of the decision maker. It is very difficult to create change unless you are able to show two things, in my opinion three. One, that there is actually value in changing. Second, that the risk of the change is pretty low. So change management actually is more about the second piece because none of us actually wants to change. So we need a very compelling reason to change, and we also want to be sure that like, nothing really bad will happen. Because once you get a bit suspicious that bad things will happen, you'll say, well, bad things are happening now, bad things will happen later, I can just stick with what I'm doing. And the third, and many of these are not one-offs, right? You got to do it, at least on the inventory side, you have to run it like every week or every month. Which means that it should be usable and integrated, right, from a dynamic perspective. So, the three things, going back to your answer to short to say, the model should be rich enough to be believable. It should be parsimonious enough to have the data that the company has, because people like to see their own data in action. And third, you should give them enough comfort, which is why I believe in what-if analysis. Yeah, a lot of people change this, change that, play around, play around. It's really for them to get comfortable and say, okay, I will do it. In fact, what usually happens is something like this. A company like Kellogg would say, uh, Sridhar, uh, how about we do this in Canada? And if it doesn't mess up, we'll do it in the US. Because, you know, Canadian market is not that important. If I lose a bit of money here and there, I can say it's the Canadians, whatever. Right? No, 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 right? Again, so what happens is, you, you do it, 
you clean it up, you learn something from Canada, and then you say, okay, I'll import it to the US. So the implementation uh, can also be very gentle and safe. So what usually happens is the stage one, as I said, of identifying a problem worth solving, modeling it so that it's rich enough to be believable. It has the data that people can use and say, okay, it is my data. And then you should be patient with them getting comfortable. Right? And what makes, in my opinion, this very interesting is, on the one hand, it's math. On the other hand, it's actually managing people's behavior. So I can see why someone nowadays would listen to you. Yeah, why, was, why did it, those who want to lead, go ahead and lead, okay? Those who want to stay can stay. I just want to make sure those who actually want to lead feel comfortable walking out. So you, you've been so successful, and now like, you, I feel like you just show up to a company and say, do this, and people will listen, right? When you showed up the first time, why did Good. anyone listen to you? Good. In fact, when I first showed up the first time, they did it. Uh, I made a hundred trips and got no customers. Because they said, you're a smart guy, you're a professor, you may be good at math, but by God, what do you know about managing global inventory? And guess what? My patient depends on it. You're a tenured professor, you're going to get your salary, all right? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for coming and wasting my time. Right? Exactly. So then I realized that I need to find people who are looking for something new. And one of the things you'll learn is to read Jeffrey Moore's book. Uh, it's called Crossing the Chasm. Okay? What you need to identify when you get started is something called early adopters. There's always somebody who wants to do something different. There's always a pioneer. There's always somebody who is kind of irritated with the status quo. You need to identify that person. Right? Without going into details of how I identified, that was point number one. Then you go and find five or six early adopters and say, guys, I know this is half -baked. I know that I don't have experience in this. Can we work together, right, in this alpha beta mode? Right, clean this up. But you be my first five or six references. Right, so I went to GlaxoSmithKline and I went to Bayer and I went to Kellogg's because they have had a history of being early adopters in using new technologies in supply chain management. Right, that was step one. And then I said, guys, what I need is a phone. When I go to customer number seven, I want you to call. I want Kellogg's to say, oh, I'm Rich Dragney, I'm the senior director of product availability. Yes, I report to the BPO supply chain. Yep, we use SAP. Yep, I've been in the business for 19 years. Yep, I got my undergraduate, uh, uh, you know, Georgia Tech. All right. You use smart ops? Yeah. It works? Yeah. Okay, I'll talk to you. Right? So, so step one is the early adopters. The next step are something called the leading majority. You go from about six to about 25. They don't want to be the first, but they don't want to be really last. But what they want is somebody ahead of them in their industry. So if you're a chemical company, you want a chemical guy ahead of you. Right? So you want to get the second and the third and the fourth in those six words. Right? And once you have the leading majority, then you say, I'm going to simplify the message, I'm going to let it run. Right? And then the machinery kind of works. So step one is basically identifying people who are looking for something different and working very closely. Right? And then you scale. It's a long process. It took me a long time. I started the company in 2000. I retired uh, uh, this time last year. Um, these projects seem to be fairly technical in nature, and I imagine they have lots of details to think. Being a manager over a technical project, how much should you concern yourself with really understanding the nuts and bolts of what's going on, or where do you draw the line and say, I can't know every single detail, I will leave that to my engineer? I would say, because I'm not a computer scientist, uh, and I, uh, I mean, I, I know how to write code, but yeah, that's different from creating uh, commercial grade code. Uh, that was entirely left to the CTO and the VP of engineering. I had to rely on a chief architect who came out and said, we're going to do Oracle, there's going to be the database structure, and we're going to use uh, these kind of, 
in a framework. Uh, these are the people we're going to recruit. I'm like, um, okay, uh, what's the budget? And so as a CEO, I just started to trust the CTO and the VP of engineering and hand them the money and say, is it working or not working? Uh, because I was an OR guy, I'm still an OR guy, but yeah, uh, the algo people, the people who actually wrote the calculator, I knew very well exactly what they were doing because they're all my type. Right? So I knew the algo part fairly well. Uh, but the computer science part, uh, I wasn't able to go to your talk earlier today. How did you get uh, seed money? How did you get started financially? So uh, at that time there was a uh, 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 it's like a case competition, mm, you know. Right? Many times uh, every city has a case competition. Like entrepreneurs will create, no, the VCs, venture capital community will kick off a case competition. So I participated. There were about uh, I think 300 uh, business plans that were uh, in the competition, and like two or three rounds. Anyway, so uh, my plan came in first, and so that was it up in the newspaper. Say hey, so and so wins, uh, you know, enterprise business case competition. So then I got a call, uh, a few calls from the venture capitalists, but I was uh, uh, not sure that I was ready to take institutional money at the time. Uh, for two reasons: one, uh, I'm myself a risk-averse person, not standing that I'm an entrepreneur, <laughs> uh, and I was not very aware of you know VCs and things of that type. And I was always afraid of this, you know, VCs. I felt they were a bit too sharp for me. Uh, you know, from a money uh, perspective. Uh, but I was also uh, lucky because I had done some consulting before, you know, so I knew people uh, at McKinsey and, you know, and, and, and so when I told them that I was doing this and they read this in the newspaper, uh, I raised about a million or a million one from uh, these, uh, I called them the Angel Ron, but they were not, uh, they were not friends and family. Uh, they were professional, uh, you know, the professionals that I had worked with. And they said, oh, we have worked with you, you know, we can drop a hundred or two fifty or in other case maybe uh, to help you. So I had about, uh, I had a few people at 200, a few people at 100, and a few people at 50. And that's how I got started to get the first few engineers and the first few MBAs uh, to go get the first few, <laughs> you know, uh, early adopters with, uh, you know, like a decent code, but that was not prime bank. And once we had reached uh, a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, uh, proof that this was more than just, you know, professor talking, uh, I uh, told one of my other MBAs, who was a Harvard MBA, uh, to basically create a pitch document for venture capital, for institutional money. And he probably pitched it to 50 people, 50 companies. Uh, we got it down to about 10, and then me, his name is AJ, and then Martin, who was an MBA from Wharton, the three of us did road trips uh, to meet about 10. I stuck to the Northeast because this was in Pittsburgh, I didn't want to go all the West Coast. So I did Washington DC, New York, Boston, Pittsburgh. So those were kind of the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic VCs are the ones we targeted. I had four uh, uh, what are called term sheets. So this is a, a non-binding uh, uh, letter you get from the VC saying, okay, we like it. If you sign this document, uh, you give us rights to do some due diligence on your technology and talk to your references and do some market sizing. And if that comes up right, we'll agree to these terms. This is the amount of money, preferred share versus common stock, board structure. So that's called a term sheet. So I had about four term sheets. Uh, uh, the one VC really liked in the mid-Atlantic, uh, was very well known VC. His term sheet was, in some sense, the most difficult for me to swallow. Uh, because it was, it was very stringent on, uh, on, on a variety of things. So I went with, uh, you know, uh, another VC that had good reputation, uh, but the terms were more amenable to me. That's a negotiation. And so uh, uh, we raised 10 million on that. So I took 8 million from the VCs, and um, the people who gave me the first 1 million uh, participated in this round as well by adding another two. So by the end of this round, I had 11 million. And that got me a great one way to, you know, start building the product, you know, enhancing the engineering team, building marketing teams, right? Uh, and then 
about a year later, uh, because we were doing quite well, uh, we got pretty good terms for another seven million. So the total capitalization is 18 million, which is very low for an enterprise company. Uh, and I brought it to profitability by end of 2003. Three? Yeah. So I've been profitable since 04. And sometime in 09, actually, uh, uh, we started uh, getting some interest in terms of selling the company. Uh, but a uh, more important decision we made was to partner with SAP so that uh, we are on the price list. Uh, but some of my early investors were getting uncomfortable with the amount of weight they had. And so we had generated so much cash that I actually bought back stock in 09. And I cashed out those investors who wanted you know, exit at that time. Interestingly, once I offered the exit, less than half of them took it. Because they said, you're not taking it. I said, no. They said, then I, I won't take it. I said, I'm just telling you, if you're bored with it, you want some money back, here it is. If you want to stick around for a bigger payday later, but with all the uncertainty in the system, stick around. So some people took it, you know. So this is a company buyback? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so basically what you do is you retire the stock and you give them cash. So every year around this time, uh, we get a few offers. So in fact, when, uh, when I was sitting there, one of the emails I was checking was potentially another offer to look at. When I was the CEO, I would, I would look at companies to buy to expand their own product line. All the engineers hated it because they said, we can win anything, right? Uh, <laughs> right? But as a CEO, I'm like, you know, yeah, we'll take you three years when I can buy something right away. But, uh, and then, uh, you know, you field questions of people who uh, want to buy you. Do Two reasons. Uh, one, uh, the IPO uh, market uh, over the last four or five years, it's, 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 it's very bad. I mean, the valuations are not good. It's just, just too much volatility. Um, and, you know, when I look at the size of the company, I look at the overhead that goes with not only the S1 and the filing process. Uh, you know, if you could have done a NASDAQ small cap, you know, uh, kind of an IPO. You look at the regulations. I mean, I would be spending so much money just doing accounting and paperwork. I mean, it just. So you know, I was telling my guys that I would never want to be a CEO of a publicly traded company. You know, it would make life miserable. Just too much. Uh, I think it makes sense once you're beyond a certain size because they're making so much money and you want the exit, you know, and so on and so forth. I felt we were not big enough. Is it really the CFO that gets the headache, though? But these days, you know, uh, you can't get away by saying, hey, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> 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 and when, when the CFO goes to jail, really? typically the CEO also goes to jail. I mean, it's like... <laughs> I'm not saying that they're jail-worthy. What I'm saying is that... <laughs> uh, I, I just don't want to get Okay, I hope this was helpful, something different. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot.